Wake Up with Patty Catter. I love the show. I never miss an episode. It's the best. I turn it on and turn it up. You're listening to and watching Wake Up with Patty Catter, and I am your host, Patty Catter. Today, I have Justin Roberts on the show. Justin served in the United States Army as a 56 Alpha. Now, here's a quiz for you. Who knows what that is? Um, just kidding. It is a chaplain, and I don't know that everybody actually knows what that is. Probably military people do, but a civilian like myself, I hear a lot of different acronyms and things like that, but I never really thought about the MOS of a chaplain. So I'm very happy to have Justin on the show today. Justin, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So I always ask my guests at the beginning of the show to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself when you were younger growing up. What kind of home did you come from? Oh, gosh, that's like a, a loaded question. The uh, Growing up, I grew up in a small town, Stephenville, Texas, which is about an hour southwest of Fort Worth. And my mom was a nurse. My dad was a drug dealer and sometimes worked in carpentry, but made most of his money selling drugs. And uh, so that was my childhood when they divorced, you know, she had to leave them. And, uh, but I would still, you'd have part time with us. And so I still kind of remember that lifestyle uh, with me and my brother growing up out on the land, 40 acres and uh, that business going on. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So yeah, not a typical story for a chaplain, Uh, you know, that doesn't kind of naturally segue to, you know, military chaplaincy, but that, that was my childhood. Mm-hmm. Actually, you'd be surprised. A lot of my guests, um, they either had a really nice childhood or their childhood was very trying and they learned a lot from it and they grew a lot from it as they progressed through their life. So it sounds yeah. like you have that, that, that progression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of twists and turns. Mm-hmm. Did you know your dad was selling drugs when you were younger? Yeah. Yeah. It was out in front of us. And so, you know, he talked about the business and, you know, I was so little though. It's kind of like understanding your dad's job. You don't really understand it, but you also don't know what's normal. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so that was our normal. And, um, but yeah, it's, it was different. Yeah. Did you have any kind of a religion in your home? No, just kind of nominal. And you know, they were Christian, but not actively. And so it uh, wasn't a lot of church going or anything like that. And it was, he had gone in and out of jail, in and out of mental ward, very mean, abusive guy. So that's why my mom had to leave him. Before he left town, after Hurricane Hugo in South Carolina, he decided to go up there, try go back into carpentry, kind of get his life straight. And uh, he had got a church to give me a Bible. And in the Bible, they had actually marked out the ladies, like, don't try to read this all the way through. She wrote a letter to me. It's like, because like you get lost in like Deuteronomy or something if you're, you know, trying to. And I was 13 years old at the time. And so she had marked out how, you know, walked me through what's called the Roman roads, which kind of led me to doing the prayer where I accepted Christ. And um, the way that came about though, was my father attempted suicide and permanently brain damaged himself when I was 13. And at that time I was trying to figure out how to kill myself as well. Cause I was like, well, if this is all there is to this life. I'm seeing him go down this road. And I was like, maybe I should go down myself. Um, but I decided to, um, you know, put out, I was looking around And I was looking for an option other than that, you know, so I, I had a Bible on my nightstand that the lady had got me and I started going through that. And so instead of killing myself, I accepted the Lord Mm -hmm. and that led me to this, you know, to being a chaplain. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who either thought about suicide or, um, have been, uh, like had a family member commit suicide, um, they do turn to religion a lot, um, or Mm -hmm. they kill themselves and they, or they go, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of choices once you, I think, um, are in that position where you think that you may want to just end it all. You either all of a sudden want to find hope or 
not, you know what I mean? Um, uh, a lot of suicide survivors, I've heard that from anyways. So yeah. And you know what, for me, it was like, uh, I felt connected. Like when I started going through the scriptures and I felt this concept of God, I felt connected to him. And, you know, for me, I found a father that I've never had. And so everything came into alignment for me at that moment. And, um, I knew from that, you know, from that point, but also, um, a little later, it's like, I, I knew I wanted to go into ministry and I didn't know how it was going to all connect though. And I also knew I was going to go into the military. My, my grandfather was the only like positive role, male role model I had in my life at the time, you know, he was, uh, served in, uh, the occupation of Japan, Korea, and the beginning of Vietnam. So I was like, you know, I want to be like this guy. And, and I really looked up to him. And so I knew I wanted to go into ministry. I knew I wanted to go into the military, but I didn't know how they were going to combine because I didn't know about chaplains until later. And then I was like, ah, that's my thing. You know, I could do both. Mm-hmm. And that's what led me to the chaplain corps. Mm-hmm. Now for you, you, um, well, let's go to through high school. So, um, yeah, so you, years. yes. How, how were you, you said you were 13 when you received that Bible, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So then, I mean, how were you in high school? Because high school is a really hard time for everybody. Yeah, it is. It is. And you know what? I remember I, I felt like an alien among normal people and I'm sure that's common, but whenever you come from, uh, an abusive home, you're, your uh, social uh, fluency is just different. You know, sometimes you're stunted. Sometimes you're just, you're just flat out different and you perceive things differently mm-hmm. and you're, you're managing this reality very differently. And so I just remember looking, you know, at my peers and I was like, man, they just, they know how to sync together. And I felt like an outsider looking in always and I didn't really have a group, but I hung out with a lot of different people. Uh, but I didn't know how to sink in with the friendship. So there's a lot of isolation. You know, you just felt alone. Um, but I was also, I knew I felt very connected to God. And I knew I wasn't going to go down the same path my father went down. I was like, that one truth. I was like, don't do what he did you know, became very concrete in my life. So I never tried alcohol. I never tried drugs, never tried cigarettes, never tried anything. Um, I, and so of course there's a lot of the, you know, the peer pressure to do that stuff. And I never did. And so for 41 years, I've never tried alcohol or anything. Just, like ever? Uh, ever. Wow. You know, it's just a rule in my life. And you know, it was weird though. I, I, I found out other people who have come through you know, abusive, um, addicted parents, a lot of them have done kind of like, I am never doing this. Mm-hmm. You know, no, that makes that sense. Fear. Yeah. Cause so, like, if I have that chip, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't want to do that to my kids. I don't want to go down that road. So that's kind of guided my life. And so, but that also offsets you socially. So it's just been kind of odd. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it was good though. I, I, um, you know, I, I got into martial arts and that became a big part of my life. You know, just processing anger. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So how old were you when you decided to join the military? Like really um, do it? I mean, it sounds like you knew you wanted to do it when you were younger, but like, when did you go ahead and think, okay, I'm going to go to the recruiting office. Uh, it was towards the end of college. Cause I knew I wanted to become a chaplain. So, I know I needed to get college knocked out, uh, but I was, I met my wife and uh, I was, I had to move schools to go be with her. And so I was like 20 and um, I knew this was the girl that I wanted to marry. And so I was like, okay, I need to go be near her so I can pursue her. And, you know, we were already talking and we kind of knew what direction we're probably going to go in. Uh, so I moved down to Louisiana. Uh, but I needed to pay for school because, you know, I had, you know, money for Texas schools, but not for Louisiana. So I enlisted 
And um, for just like a year, I was enlisted. So I went through basic and all that kind of stuff. And then when I got out, um, immediately I went to seminary. And whenever you go to seminary, you can do a direct commission and be a part of the chapel candidate program. And so that's how I became, you know, a chaplain, second lieutenant. Mm-hmm. While I was going through seminary, but I started going through chaplain officer basic corps, which is really weird because over there, at least at that time, the NCOs could not yell. The drill sergeants couldn't yell at you, which you go through regular basic experience. You know, they do nothing but yell at you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was expecting that. Yeah. And I was like, and I was like, I would see them like take this dumb chaplain, <laughs> and, you know, doing something stupid and you would see them want to yell so bad. <laughs> like everything in their essence is rising up. Veins are popping, but they can't because they got to make this person positive. So, so I was like, wow, it's just a different world. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's how I became a chaplain. And once I got into seminary, I went to Dallas Theological Seminary and uh, joined the chaplain candidate program. And then that's when my career began as a chaplain. Wow. And you ended up deploying to combat at least once. How many times were you in combat? Um, in, I, I did one deployment. Uh, I lost count of like how many times we were getting shot at, though. Because mm-hmm. it was just, it was Kunar province, Afghanistan. So it's like every other day, mm-hmm. you know, every third day just kind of varies. Sometimes every day. Yeah. So, so you were in combat, you're getting shot at a lot. Um, obviously as a Christian, you're probably like, okay, God, I know where I'm going. So were you still frightened though at all? Um, not usually like during it, like there would always be like a, uh, a time the night before, before, like, you know, we knew we were going to go on an operation. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh man, you know, going out, I don't know how it's going to end. Mm-hmm. And usually I would look over and see one of the younger guys because I was in like my early 30s at the time. And I'd look over and I'd see like a 20 year old. He was just cleaning his weapon or just kind of getting ready for it. And I just kind of determined if he's doing it, I'm doing it, you know, and I'm not going to punk out on him. And uh, so, and I just kind of made my peace like whatever happens is going to happen. So, and then whenever the day came, it's like, all right, you kind of made my resolution the other day before. So I knew once it started hitting, it's just kind of waiting until the firefight starts. Like once the firefight would start, then it's usually way better for me, at least. It's like, I was a lot more at ease after the bullets. Cause like, you're just kind of waiting and you don't know if it's going to be an ambush or if it's going to be, you know, something that's going to you know pop up and blow up on you, you know? So you're just, waiting for the initial contact is then you kind of know where they're coming from, you know, what the enemy's doing, how they're approaching it. And so it becomes a lot more manageable. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I recognized back at home while a lot of our soldiers were fighting um, on Fort Bragg um, because my husband was stationed with the 82nd at Fort Bragg when they were deployed, I think it it was it had to have been either been 2006 or 2007. I remember that the um, chapels on post had to take out all of the crosses of their chapels, and I don't think they ever put them back. And I remember hearing it was because they're trying to appease all religions. Was that difficult for you as a chaplain raised Christian? No, not really. Like the the chapel to me is just a building. So I don't really think too much about it. I'm not too worried about it. The, and it's not a, a Christian building. It's a government building. You know, so the way that they would try to do it is set it up to where when the rabbis came in, they could have it as their space. When the Muslims came in, they could have it as their space. Same for the Buddhists. And, and then same for the Christians. And we share this space. And I work with those dudes. You know, those are my friends. And, and I want them to have that space. So it's not a Christian building because buildings can be Christian. You know, so if there's crosses, and I think they should be able to have crosses, but then for that Jewish service, you know, they're, they're going to have their religious symbols and same thing for all of the other space. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, I never really had any of those kind of issues because like it, at the end of the day, 
when my buddy Rabbi Shulman needs to do a service, I want him to have a good service. I want his people to have a good service. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't realize this. I just had an aha moment. So I was under the impression that all chaplains just had to perform any kind of religious services or mm -hmm. duties. So there are rabbis and there are, okay. Yeah. I, I didn't realize yeah, that. So you, you perform your faith. Mm -hmm. And so I was a Protestant Christian. Mm -hmm. and still am. And so my job was to perform or provide. So you perform your faith or you make sure that the spiritual needs of whoever you're talking to are, are met. So if they're Jewish, you connect them with a rabbi. Mm -hmm. um, if they're Catholic, you connect them with a priest, a Buddhist, or whatever. And so to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. And so you're not just a chaplain for Christians. You're a chaplain for everybody, whatever, whoever they are. Like I, whenever I first get to my unit and I have my first speech in front of everybody, I would tell them, you're all a bunch of heathens, but you're my heathens. <laughs> and so we're going to get through this journey together. Whatever we may face, we will face it together. And so whatever their faith group was, I do my best to provide for it because I want, you know, I want everybody to have that. And it's not about bashing you over the head with my beliefs. Yeah, you know, it's about loving you. That's the job of a chaplain. So do you remember one of the hardest things that you had to overcome as far as, is there anything that shook your faith, especially maybe in the combat zone or did you feel more connected because of that situation? Yeah, that uh, it does for some people. And I never want to act like um, I'm holier than thou or more spiritually mature than other people because that's not the case. Um, but for me, it, it comes down to do I know God? And there was never a point where I could tell myself I don't know him, you know, because I, I know him. And so for me, my faith is based on a relationship and experience and not a culture and not, you know, other things. And so whenever I go through these really big struggles, I've always, I've always known him and I know him. And so it didn't ever shake on that level. And so when I was going through these trials and struggles, I would just connect with him on it. And it was a source of comfort for me. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of combat, a lot of loss. You know, we had, 18 killed in action, 200 purple hearts from an 800 man unit. So it was very kinetic and there was a lot of suffering and it was a lot of people I cared about. But for me, God was that source of comfort when I was going through it. Um, I know a lot of people, um, soldiers who are deployed really depend upon the chapel and are the chaplains. Um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that that has to be really difficult too, because they kind of look at you obviously for strong guidance, but I feel like I've met a lot of people along the way too, who they get really mad at God because of their situation. Yeah. And then they go to the pastor or the chaplain and they're still mad at God and they're trying to talk to you. And how do you deal with that? Because yeah. it's, it's a funny thing is like, honestly, like when people, they treat you however they're thinking about God. And so if they're mad at God or doing something that they're ashamed of, they'll avoid you. <laughs> and so it's weird. It's like, like, I don't care. You know, it's like, Hey, you're doing your thing. You're ashamed, but then you, they'll, they'll take it and project it out on you. And you're like, okay. You know, uh, and I had that happen several times and I still have that happen to me. Um, and that's okay. But I've seen that play out several times. And sometimes you making peace with them becomes the way they make peace with God. And you letting them know, okay, you're, you're, you're being a jerk to me. You know, you're, you're being whatever. Or you're avoiding me. You know, just letting them know that you still love them. The only way that they're going to conceive of the love of God is from the love that you give them. And full acceptance. No judgment. Love you. I'm here for you. I care about you. Full stop. And that's it. You know, it's like if yeah. they receive that from you in a very genuine way, then it allows them to conceive of God loving them in that way too. And then that was oftentimes or some of the time, like where the healing would come from is by working out that relationship with them whenever I see that stuff happen. But you know, I've been in ministry for a long time. And so 
it, it took me, it was actually when I was in college, I was still working, you know, doing ministry. And I started experiencing this kind of stuff playing out, this projecting. And that's when I started, it started to dawn on me that they don't have like just a personal issue with me. They're having a personal issue with God and taking it out on me. And I was like, ah, okay. Now I know how to work at it. Because oftentimes you're like, oh man, there must be something wrong with me. <laughs> you know, I'm just, you know, uh, I, I, you go through your head like, what did I say? What did I do? No, sometimes it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about people who are afraid to come to you because they don't want to tell you their deepest, darkest spider web, cobweb, mind bending um, issues, but they, they feel like they need to talk to someone, but they're, they're scared to, they're, they're not trusting you maybe. Um, What would you tell somebody who they really need to talk to someone, but they're afraid to reach out? You know what the oftentimes what it was is they felt like it was like such a jumbled, potentially explosive mess. And they have their arms wrapped around it. And they're so afraid that if they kind of let go, that it would become such a big explosion and such a big mess, they would never be able to put it all back together. And a lot of people are walking around with that feeling like, oh my gosh, if if I just let this go and I don't hold on to it the way I'm holding on to it, I will never be able to put it back together. And also what are the consequences? Because if people see me fall apart, dear God, uh, I will, it'll affect me in so many horrific ways. And that was often the fear to keep dudes from talking. And the only way that you get around that is by establishing relationships. And so for me, uh, every morning I would do a walk around. First thing after breakfast, do my walk around through the battalion area. And for the first two months, you know, everybody's kind of feeling you out. You know, are you going to bash them over the head with religion? Are you going to judge them? Are you going to be socially awkward? Um, And after a while, after they get to see your face enough times, you go from being chaplain to chappy. And chappy, chappy is the best word. You know, because then it's like you are now synced in more. They're going to joke around with you. You have to joke around with them. Uh, it's going to be crass. You know, they, they start letting their guard down a lot more cuss words and that's where it needs to be. Everything needs to be real and legitimate. And it's at that point you get the, Hey, Chappie, can I talk to you? And and where you're doing your walk arounds because a lot of times they don't want to go over to your office because somebody might see them walking over to your office and the, Hey, Chappie's can I talk to you lead to where the real stuff gets discussed. And so it's, there's a field craft to, to it, just like everything in the military, there's a field craft to it. And you have to know how to socially sink in to where it's not, it's, it's not like they're talking to a chaplain, they're talking to a friend and you have to earn that and you have to be present to earn that. And so that's how I went about the ministry. It's like, you're, you're almost kind of like Ferris Bueller and <laughs> Ferris Bueller's day off. You're going around, you're talking to people, you're helping people and you just love them. And that's it. Yeah. When you decided to go ahead and sign up for the army, did you realize that you were going to probably go to combat zones? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know what the, uh, at first I was looking at the reserves and uh, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life you know, and how to manage this thing. But I went to a practicum over at Brook Army Medical Hospital and I was working with the burn victims and amputees. And I saw this one amputee who was like through blood, sweat, and tears. Like he was pumping the iron. He was hitting it hard. And I saw that he was in pain on top of the pain coming from the workout. I mean, from his own injuries. And uh, I saw the way that he was pursuing it. I was like, hey, man, like, what's what's driving you in this right now? He's like, I got to get back to my, my guys. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like wherever his guys are, that's where I want to be because that kind of dedication, that kind of heart, that's, that's who I want to be a chaplain for. And yeah. Yeah. And I could, I can see that too, where you probably really desperately wanted a family and military is definitely family. Yeah. Um, that's Let's amazing. Try. But it's, it's people who, you know, unlike so many other places in the world, they'll fight and die for you. You know, they legitimately care and they'll, they'll prove it on the battlefield. You know, it's crass, it's, they're smelly, 
they're vulgar, they're violent, um, but they are far more honest than most people in churches. They are. I'll tell you what, um, I have a lot of friends who are military and if anything is, has ever bugged me, um, the first thing that I get asked is who was it? And do you want me to help you? <laughs> I I like that. um, I mean, you know, they're not going to actually go hurt somebody, but I like the fact we're on air. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) But, uh, but really I I do know, I mean, they probably would if, if it needed to be like, if you know what I mean, like if we were in a horrible situation and somebody had a gun on me, I know that they would, you know, obviously help me. And um, it's just the same with everything, any kind of struggle. If I ever voice it, I literally um, put something on Facebook not too long ago about a business owner I was dealing with and it was very, really tough. And I don't even know how many veterans said, who is it? Who is it? And um, just trying to help. And I yeah. felt very, you know, protected. Um, one of the things that I've noticed too is veterans who um, have legitimate PTSD from combat have been the most caring people I have ever mm-hmm. met. Um they're so understanding and, um, just so, so, so caring. There, there used to be a stigma a little bit about, you know, if you went to combat and you have PTSD, you're crazy, but no, anybody I've met and had a, you know, a friendship with has been incredibly embracive and so caring. So, um, one thing I have to tell you is a couple of weeks ago, I posted in my group that I was going to be interviewing you And one of your soldiers um, that you were chaplain to commented and had such great things to say about you, Ryan um, Koch or Koch, or I call him Ryan Koch. I'm always horrible at last names, K-O-C-H. But the cool (laughs) thing is years ago, like in 2011, he was, he was a volunteer for an organization that I was running for veterans. Um, and so it was really cool to see that you had such a huge impact on him and how much he respects you and cares about you. And same with Hank Barb. Um, do you realize how many lives you've probably touched? I mean, those are just two people that out of the blue I know of, and I'm sure there's a lot more. You know, it's weird. It's like, it just feels like it's you know, family. And like, so you just kind of go along, you meet people and they become family and you love them. And they impact your life. So it doesn't ever feel like I've given more than I've gotten. Um, I mean, still this day, I mean, Hank's helping me. He listens to me. So it is not an uneven relationship. I became a chaplain at first with the idea that I was going to preach and teach. But I have learned more about God from the infantrymen than I ever did from any other pastor. I mean, like how to sincerely love. They don't teach that at seminary. They don't teach that in the churches like they should. You you go out to places like this and you see people who are literally throwing their lives um, into a battlefield, into bullets, knowing that they're going to die, trying to save somebody else. That's the greatest sermon I've ever heard. That's the most powerful theology that's ever been taught to me. So I understand God so much more you know, from these people than I ever did from anywhere else. And so that's why I'm committed to it. That's why I also struggle when I come back with churches and and so much of the religion here, because it was so much more real to me over there. And with these people who are considered vulgar and violent and perverted and, you know, all these crass things, but they understand the heart of God in more ways than most do because the heart of God is love. And, that's the centerpiece of Christian theology. This is everything that Jesus talked about. And I saw it expressed so much more from these guys. So I feel, um, I don't know. It's just, it, I feel more blessed by them than everything I could ever have given to them. And it's like the only thing I ever wanted them to know is that I care, you know? And, uh, I tried my best at that. Mm-hmm. I know, um, Along the lines of post-traumatic stress, uh, I know a lot of veterans who do struggle with it and they are still searching for people to talk to sometimes after their time in service. Um, are you still active duty? No, no. I'm uh, just a full-time filmmaker now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, I got out and I was starting to look at my career and I was like, uh, 
um, it was time for me to get out. You know, I, I really loved being a battalion chaplain. You know, like that, if I, if I could have done that for 20 years, I might have stayed in and then just been a battalion chaplain. Um, but they promote you um, if you're doing okay. And so I was starting to look at that. And I, I have a passion. My second master's is in media arts and communication. And um, I knew that that was the next chapter of my life was going to be filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Which is cool because a couple of weeks ago, for those watching, it will be because this is a pre-record. Um, we talked about your series called Do Good. So you are still doing really good for people and you're um, just such a caring person. Did you struggle at all or do you still struggle with um, any of the thoughts that you had from combat or are you able to let that go? I, You know, it's changed over time. I mean, it's still difficult and I still struggle with depression you know, and, and PTSD. Um, but I have an amazing network that helps me cope. And so, you know, I'm going on this journey, like working through it. And what I've decided is just to kind of open it up, you know, open up the conversation and not keep it such a private thing, but to share the journey of what I'm going through. So we're working on that and putting a project together around that. Because as I talk with other veterans and like what is working for them, I'm like, I don't want to try that. Like that sounds amazing. And so I think that's going to be the, the future of what we're working on with Do Good. You know, we're covering the disaster stuff right now. And I think we're going to do a season focused on veteran issues and, and then just diving in, you know, to to that journey. And so that way we can look at all the different angles of it. And uh it's, it's almost like a buffet of options that not every single one of them is going to be for you, but there is one for you. You just have to search for it and find it. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Um, or do you have any words that you could share with somebody who's listening, who um, might be still struggling with thoughts either of suicide or some of the things that they faced in combat or survivor's guilt? Um, there's a lot of different things that uh, veterans are struggling with after their time in, in the military. What can you tell them to give them a little bit of peace or hope, or do you have any a resource maybe for them or anything? Yeah, I think for, for the ones that are still struggling, it's just getting around the idea that they're not alone in this. And there is hope, even if there seems like there's not, you've been stuck in this cycle and this bleakness and it doesn't feel like it's ever going to get better. It's only getting worse. And that's when suicide really starts to become an option is this feeling that it's not going to get better. And what I've seen again and again and again is that if they hold on and they push further and they get over the hill, it does get better. And there is this incredible hope. And what's amazing is that then you take the healing that you found and you're able to give it to other people. And if that's not worth fighting for, fighting for yourself is not enough. Just knowing that by you fighting for yourself, you can help save other people, you know, other brothers that you, you know, fought alongside with, then it does become worth it. And I'm not always going to fight to fix myself, but if I know that I'm, by doing this, I'm going to help other people. I do it <laughs> because I need to, and I will. And uh, that changes things. It's not just about you. And so, yeah, the the suicide issue for me is like the, um, the I don't know how much time we have. I, I don't want to. We're good. You we're good? Okay. Yeah. The, well, you know, I went through with the suicide stuff, my own struggle, my father's struggle. And then my second day on the job, when I became a chaplain, we had our first suicide. And then we had another suicide a week later, and then another one a couple months later, and then another one. And so we had a suicide every single, a suicidal gesture or attempt every single week for the first six months as well. So in 2009, this was the most suicidal battalion in the military. We were able to turn it around by one, we stopped the PowerPoint presentations. No, they're not working. Yeah. Uh, we sat with every single platoon. I sat with every single platoon and we started talking, you know, having a real talk about what are the biggest issues that we're going through? How can we be a solution for each other? And 
what does brotherhood mean to us as predominantly male unit? So what does brotherhood really mean to us? And if we're willing to go through, you know, bullets to save each other on the battlefield, what are we willing to do here with these life issues that are killing as many people as combat does? And so they started working out their own solutions and for each other in that small tribe. And so we did that program before the deployment. We also did it during the deployment. We kept up the conversation. We were very suicidal on the front end. We had a very traumatic deployment. Um, when we got back, there was zero suicides and a 70% reduction in suicidal ideations. And it wasn't because they just had a really good looking chaplain. Part of the equation, but not you know, the whole. It was mainly. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's highly effective. But it, what it was is like they started talking and really engaging with each other. They, I, I saw a big increase in guys coming up and saying, hey, Chappie, you need to talk to so-and-so. I was talking with him. He's going through this or that. And then buddies bring in and buddies to come talk to me. That's a huge culture shift because that meant that that guy talked to that guy. And he was able to open up about what he was going through. That's exactly what we need right now. This ability to talk and to know that they're not going to judge you, call you stupid names, or think less of you because you're going through something. If we shift that one thing in our culture, we'll have a dramatic reduction in suicides. Mm-hmm. But it has to be a culture shift. And so that, that's what I experienced. You know, we call the program Warrior's Keeper. Um, you know, and then I moved. And uh, it, you know, kind of faded out. And I was like, man, it's like, I we need to have that culture shift. So I'm going to be trying to work on bringing it back because the suicide numbers haven't dropped. And we haven't figured this thing out. You know, it's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. I think the biggest problem is we've been approaching it as just an individual medical problem, not a cultural problem. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I so definitely. That was agree. that was my experience. But the uh, that's what led me to going on the missions with the guys. I uh, had a good first sergeant who was a mentor of mine, and he's like, "If you really want to connect with the guys, then you need to go out with each platoon at least once and meet near, near the front during major operations, and they'll talk to you." And at the time, for us, it wasn't just a nice thing for the chaplain to connect. You know, it was mission critical because otherwise more suicides were happening and we would have more deaths. So as a way to prevent deaths, uh, I needed to connect. And uh, so I went on the missions and sure enough, he was right. Anytime I went on a mission and we got into combat with that platoon, shortly after my counseling load was shooting up and it wasn't because the guys were like, you know, twitching from combat and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, it was just life issues, marriages, divorces, mm-hmm. parents dying, life, depression, you know, things. So, um, but that helped us to reduce the, the number of suicides that were going on. So, yeah. If you do start that program back up, let me know. Yeah. Because I do think it's really important and I'd like to share that with my listeners. Also, if you're listening um, and you are actively suicidal, you believe, um, please reach out to the Veterans Crisis Hotline. Um, and I have the information. Um, it'll be on the screen. It's on my social media, in my notes for my show. And also, if you just need someone to talk to, I mean, you can talk to me. I'm not a counselor, a licensed counselor or anything. Um, and I'm sure that I'll have some more resources to share for with you um, as well. Um, but Justin, thank you so much for being on the show. And um, thank you so much just for sharing, because I do think that the most important thing is, like you said, you're not alone. Yeah. And that's a very important message. So yeah, everybody yeah. just remember you're not alone. I was going to say, like, if they, if they want to see part of my journey, uh, I, I did, I started filming when I was in combat and we, oh, yes. yeah, <laughs> no, you know, we put together a documentary uh, called no greater loves and, uh, chaplains can't carry weapons. So I was given permission to carry a camera. And when I was going out on the patrols, um, we captured some of that journey and, um, you know, it was some large battles, but more importantly, it was uh, 
bind every act of valor what I saw was a selfless love. And so that was the lesson that I learned from the guys that I served with. And that's why we put the film together is, you know, the best way that I could honor them. And so we put the film together and it was a kind of a weird journey of doing that. But uh, we did film festivals and wound up winning 11 awards at film festivals that we screened it at the White House before Congress. And then it released theatrically and it's on Amazon Prime right now. And so that's called No Greater Love. And it's a hard film, especially if you've been in combat or gone through this journey. So just be prepped up for that. But if you want to take a look at it, and, um, for me, it was a way of putting those pieces together, you know, what I'd been through. And so, and the hope was it would help other people too. They were still trying to put those pieces together. Mm-hmm, and, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's No Greater Love. And then um, the our current series is called Do Good. And it's with Hank, uh, who's a former combat medic. And uh, my home was recently hit by Hurricane Laura and uh, you know, the devastation that happened here. So we decided to start a disaster series. And uh, we're doing it. What we're doing is we're donating the monetization views to the charities that we cover in the episodes. And then uh, so we can help raise support and awareness you know, for disaster relief and you know, our next season, we're going to be focused on veteran issues. So that's do good. That's amazing. And I'm going to be sharing that as well. Um, but definitely hop on Amazon Prime and check out No Greater Good or No Greater Love. I'm sorry. <laughs> no Greater Good. Do good. Yeah, it's, it's a <laughs> lot Check that out too. <laughs> do love. <laughs> I'm going to rename your shows for you. That is fine. <laughs> no Greater Love and also check out Do Good. <laughs> Uh, Thank you so much, Justin. I appreciate you. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. And definitely check out Justin's links. You're going to see them on your screen right now if you're watching or if you're listening. Again, they're going to be in the show notes or on my social media. And everybody, just um, remember you're not alone. And Justin, I feel like calling you Chappie now. So Chappie, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wake Up with Patty Catter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Follow Patty at Patty Catter on Facebook and Instagram. Get social. You can now watch Wake Up with Patty Catter on Amazon TV and Roku. It's the only podcast I listen to. Be sure to check out Patty's apparel line, The Patriotic Mermaid at thepatrioticmermaid.com and on social media at The Patriotic Mermaid. I love it.